This is a posset. If you look up posset today, this is something that you will find. This is a lemon posset. It is delicate and creamy. It's science. And it's absolutely delicious. You make this by taking cream, mixing it with sugar, reducing that, and it has to be just right. You have to have the right amount of sugar to the right amount of cream. Then you're gonna add lemon zest and lemon juice. And between the reduction and the lemon juice activating in that cream and curdling it, after it rests, you get something like this where when you run your spoon through it, it leaves a trail. And it's almost like a custard, but not quite. And it's not quite a mousse. It's something all together on its own. It is fancy. You feel good when you eat it. It's something that you can make for a dinner party at your house or go to a high-end restaurant and see it on the menu. But this is not where Posset started. In fact, you couldn't get further away from where Posset first started. And that's exactly what we're going to be looking into today. What did a pasta look like in the 18th century? By the time we get to the pasta in the 18th century, it's already likely changed quite a bit from when we first see it referenced. And folks can find references to even the 16th and 17th century of what a pasta is. Shakespeare used a pasta in one of his plays. It's there, it's, it's documented quite a ways back. Originally, when you see a posset, most of the time it's in the context of some being, someone being sick. And so maybe you can think about this as a sort of chicken noodle soup or let, let's get well kind of dish or beverage. And that's something else that's really funny about it too, is that sometimes a posset seems like it's like a custard or it's, um, it's, it's cream or milk mixed with bread. So other times it's referenced almost like it's a beverage or something in between like a syllabub, which we've done on the channel before. So it's kind of strange researching it back. Now, I don't know a whole lot about pasta before the 18th century, but I did find a really interesting recipe for it in the 18th century. Today's pasta recipe comes from William Ellis's The Country Housewife's Family Companion. It was published in 1750 and it is a fantastic cookbook. We use it a ton on the channel because it deals with a lot of different types of food and it has a focus on the working class and, and actually farmers. And so sometimes Ellis will actually say, hey, this is a good farmer's recipe for this time of the year and even in this activity which really just is really interesting because you get to focus on exactly when he wants you to eat it. Now, this is probably going to be fun for the comment section here. This is to make a harvest posset, the Hertfordshire, Hertfordshire wire, <laughs> dang it, the Hertfordshire way. Now, is it Hertfordshire, 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 Hertfordshire? I'm not from there, I don't know, you guys know, and you're gonna correct me Let's just have fun with it, okay? Tell me how to say this so I say it right in the future. This is very commonly done for supper, but seldom for breakfast, because for the latter, we send into the field either broth made from yesterday's meat crumbed with bread or milk porridge with bread. But for supper, we often give the harvest men a posset crumbed with bread made in this plain manner. The maid servant boils new milk and when it is so done, she puts about a pint of it into each man's wooden dish and immediately adds a quarter of a pint of stale strong beer, some coarse sugar and crumbled bread, which turns the milk into a posset and gives the men a palatable supper. But if our country housewife has a mind to make a better posset, she may take a quart of new milk and mix it with a pint of ale the yolks of eight eggs and the whites of four, which when beaten must be put in the milk and the ale. Then add some sugar and nutmeg and stir it all the while it is on, on the fire until it is thick, but it must not boil and it's done for eating. But if you will have the pasta be richer, use cream instead of milk. Now these are, these are widely different dishes. One of them's got eggs and one of them can even use cream to make it richer. It's got nutmeg 
as an extra spice. And I don't think that the other one is meant to be served with breadcrumbs because it didn't mention it in that one. But we're gonna experiment with the first one today. This is for hungry workers. This is a simple food. This is for the working class. Let's get started. Let's talk a little bit about what this dish is doing. They're not gonna be wasting resources. This is not something special, okay? This is nothing like what our posset of today is. This is to fill people up and give them enough energy to get the work they done. And then they said that they don't do this at the beginning of the day, probably because it's so heavy with the milk and the cream. They send at the beginning of the day, they send folks out with with meat broth and bread. So this is gonna be a little heavier. It's gonna sit in your stomach and be nice for you to go to sleep with. The bread doesn't matter. Whatever bread you have at home, the staler the better. Uh, that's gonna be what people are gonna be using in this. And you know, it's just sugar to taste, but the bread is not gonna give you really any great flavor. We're talking about getting something to stick to your ribs. So you come in from a hard day's work and you feel like, oh man, I'm full, I'm satisfied, now I can go to sleep and get started the next day. That's all this is. This is simply fuel. That's all it's for. It's an interesting distinction, I think, between the two different recipes. The nicer one says, heat your milk up, let it thicken, but be careful not to boil it. The first one says to boil your milk. And I think that that just shows how little care is going into that, this particular dish. If you wanna make it nicer, Sky's the limit. You can make this really nice. And there are a lot of sack and wine possets out there. I'm not saying that a posset couldn't be fancy or couldn't be nice. It very well could be. But this one, this is bare bones. We're going to get our milk in a pan, get it over the fire, get it heated up. As you can see, these don't, these don't look similar at all. And it makes you wonder, okay, what, what, is, what is holding this to still being a posset, right? I don't know if it's something about consistency. It said in the uh, recipe, when you add the bread to the milk, that will make it a posset. So are we talking about just something that's kind of thick, but not super thick? Um, almost like, this is almost like a hot cereal or a porridge kind of thing going on where, which I guess you can get to custard from there. And this is kind of like a custard. Maybe they're not meant to be anything like one another anymore. I'm not sure. I just think it's a really interesting question to ask. And one of my favorite things about cooking on this channel is that we get to ask those questions. We get to say, this is something that I like now. What did it used to look like? Or sometimes it's vice versa, like this one. I wasn't really sure about what a posset was in the modern age, I found posset a few times in old cookbooks. I thought that's interesting. I went to research it and I found what a new posset is. So sometimes you chase it backwards, but it's really fun to draw those connections between modern food, historic food. Are they still at all the same? Are they, have they deviated completely? And I think in this one, it seems like it has. Let's give it a try. Certainly is not appetizing when you look at it. That's really, really interesting. Um, so, this dark beer, you know, it's what they called for, or a strong ale, really is bitter, which I don't mind because it's warm, it kind of makes it feel like you've got coffee in a cereal, which is fine, I guess. It's not something I've, I've never poured a bowl of cereal and thought, I'm gonna put coffee in this. But uh, it's not bad. It 
a little bit more sugar brought it all together. And I like that a lot. I don't, I'm, if I'm being completely honest with you, I don't think that this is something that I'll ever sit at home and say, I'm gonna make this and eat it. But it is super interesting to see this was dinner for somebody who'd been working in the field all day. This is what they came back to you. And were they excited about it? I don't know, but it did the trick. And I don't think that anybody that we know in, you know, in our modern day neighborhoods in America think this is what I want when I come home from working at harvest. When it's cold and it's just like backbreaking labor, they're gonna come home and have some some hot cereal or porridge kind of thing. I just, I don't see it. This is where we find out the differences between then and now. This is where we find out societally uh, what, what, what's going on, what people are accepting of. You know, oftentimes now you see uh, a dinner table and it's got, you know, maybe a protein and a, and a few sides or something. That's what people think of as a dinner. Um, or if it's a single dish kind of casserole or pasta dish, it's complex. It's got lots of layers and stuff. This is some hot milk with beer and bread and a little bit of sugar. And it's fine. It's, it's actually good. But it's not what I would imagine a working man would want to finish his day off with. And that is what's fun about digging into these cookbooks.